After our first presentation on limits showed what goes right with limits and uh, what limits are, we uh, should also focus a little bit on what, on what could possibly go wrong with limits and how that situation could be salvaged. We've seen one example in that first presentation where a limit did not exist. And this presentation will talk about what can potentially still be done when a limit doesn't exist. So let's see, we're going to talk about one-sided limits and infinite limits. And the reason why we're interested in, as I said, is because there are certain possible failure modes for limits. And, uh, well, we'd like to know a little bit more about those failure modes. Take a look at this function here. Okay, at negative 4 we have a hole, but a hole is not a problem. The function has a limit there. The limit is 1. Uh, at negative 1 we've got a singularity, right? The function just blows up on either end, so that's something that we want to investigate. At 1 we've got a jump, and uh, that's something that we want to investigate. And uh, a little bit past 4, I think at about 4.5 or so, this is supposed to indicate one of those infinite oscillations like we've seen for the squeeze theorem, where essentially infinitely many oscillations are happening in a finite spot, and it's supposed to indicate that these oscillations all have uh, finite height. The height does not go to zero. That one uh, we're going to leave out. That one is typically not discussed very much in calculus classes because it is rather technical and also because there's just very little that can be done to salvage this situation, whereas this, <clears throat> this kind of failure mode and this kind of failure mode at minus one and one, that is something where we can salvage something. So we're actually going to talk about two possible failure modes for limits, this one and that one. And since we do that, let's just go ahead and make the function pretty from there on out. Okay, so one-sided approaches are the first thing we're going to look at. Uh, in the figure, just remember what the figure looked like or go back, the behavior as we approach negative one and one from the left and from the right is quite orderly. I mean, the graph is not unbroken. The graph is not flipping around like crazy. Um, uh, it's, it's just broken in, in the middle there, or, or goes off to infinity. More generally, <coughs> we can talk about one-sided approaches, uh, and it does make sense because uh, some systems radically alter they behave, their behavior at a point. Uh, for example, when a ball bounces off a wall, the velocity before the impact is different from the velocity after the impact in the sense that the sign changes, right? The ball flies towards the wall, hits, and then goes back, and, and of course, uh, if you have sufficiently high resolution, then there is a continuous change, but this kind of thing can also be modeled with a situation where the velocity is, say, plus 5 meters per second going in and minus 5 meters per second coming out. Uh, in some situations, we also only can approach from one side. For example, uh, physicists are interested in the conditions that uh, existed in the universe near the Big Bang, but when you do an investigation of those conditions, then you basically have to take a limit as time goes to zero, but time will always be greater than zero. The times before the Big Bang, if it even makes sense to talk about something like that, they will be hidden from uh, from any kind of observation or even uh, extrapolation for us. So, summary, it makes sense to discuss limiting behavior with our attention limited to one side. And, uh, in some ways, if that behavior is reasonable, if, if the function approaches something, then we can still say something about the function or about the system, and that means we'd like to define limits in that situation or for that kind of approach. So we talk about one-sided limits, and the definition is the informal definition. Again, the formal definitions all require epsilons and deltas, and that is something that you can learn in an advanced math class that is called advanced calculus or introduction to analysis or something like that. Here we're just going to work with the phenomena and picture them. Okay, the function f is set to convert to the limit l from the left at the point p. If and only if for all x smaller than p that are close to p, we have that f of x is close to l. So it's the same situation as before. Our input values have to be close to the point. Then the output values are supposed to be close to the limit. <coughs> but this time we limit ourselves to x being smaller than p, which means we really are to the left of that point. L will be called the left limit of the function at P, and that's also denoted as the limit as X approaches P from the left. That's what this minus sign here says of F of X. And the definitions for right-sided limits, which are 
the limit as x approaches p from the right plus indicates approach from the right f of x equals l. Those definitions are analogous. Good exercise to at least verbalize them or maybe even write them out, but I'm not going to do that here. Uh, yeah, good exercise. <laughs> Okay, left and right sided limits are also called one sided limits and then the limit that we are typically computing when, when everything works out we call that limit also sometimes the two sided limit. Okay, let's look at our failure modes one more time and I think we're going to look at what happens at one. Yeah, if we're looking at the limit of this function as x approaches one from the left, that's one, sure. Uh, as long as we're to the left of one and close to one yeah, those numbers look like they're getting close to an output of 1. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x is negative 2 because as we're close to, to, close to 1 and to the right of 1, yeah, it looks like the numbers are approaching negative 2. So that makes perfect sense and that's really what the definition says. There are certain functions that are then standard examples of what happens with one-sided limits and we're going to look at two of them pictorially and then one of them symbolically and uh, the floor function is a function that simply just takes any real number and truncates it to the integer part. Its graph looks like this basically the floor of any number between 0 and 1 remember any number between 0 and 1 is 0 point something you throw the point something away and so the output would be 0 the floor of any number between 1 and 2 well any number between 1 and 2 is 1 point and then some and you truncate the and then sum and so the floor is 1 similar for numbers between 2 and 3 and then also for numbers between negative 1 and uh, 0 that's where we have to be careful because numbers between negative 1 and 0 are negative point something but basically the floor function takes if we want to be uh, completely correct about it the floor function gives you the greatest integer that is below your input value and the greatest integer below negative 0.5 is negative 1, the greatest integer below negative 1.5 would be negative 2 and so on. Similar to that is the ceiling function which basically just rounds up uh, and so if you take anything between 0 and 1 that rounds up to 1 take anything between 1 and 2 and that rounds up to 2 note that we're not talking about regular rounding where the rule is 0 0.5 and, and above goes up and below 0 0.5 goes down this is just something that says if the number is 1 point anything you're going to round up to 2. If the number is 0 point anything, you're going to round up to 1. And again, rounding up for a number negative 0 point something means going up to 0. Rounding up for negative 1 point something means going up to negative 1. Uh, remember that for negative numbers, um, the absolute value does not indicate greater size. Greater size is when you're farther to the right on the x-axis. Okay, so those are just pictorial, and in both cases we can see that there are these jumps. The left limit of the uh, ceiling functions, the left limits exist, the right limits exist, and uh, well, that, that's basically just the description of the ceiling function. Standard example uh, that we can do some computation with is uh, the function f of x equals x over x absolute value looks like this. For x greater than 0, x is equal to abs x absolute value, so the output is 1. For x smaller than 0, x is the negative of its absolute value, so the output is negative 1. And, uh, well, so that means that the left limit should be negative 1, the right limit should be 1. But for this one, because we've got a formula that we should be able to compute something with, we can actually do the computation. And, uh, well, here we go. The left limit as x goes to 0 of x over x absolute value is the left limit of x over x. Uh, the, the right limit, sorry, that's a plus. Ah. Okay, the right limit uh, of x over x absolute value as x goes to 0 is the right limit of x over x because as long as x is greater than 0, x absolute value is x. And that's, of course, the limit of 1, and the limit of 1, here's where it doesn't matter whether you come in from the left or from the right, that limit is 1. The left limit of x over x absolute value is the left limit of x over negative x because as x is smaller than 0, x absolute value is equal to negative x and that's the left limit of negative 1 which is negative 1. So that confirms what we had in the picture. A quick theorem that connects things to two-sided limits, I think, if you've got a function then the two-sided limit of f at p is l if and only if the right limit of f is l and the left limit of f is l. 
And so that's the kind of situation that happens here. For example, the limit as x goes to negative 4 of this function is 1. And that's because the left limit is 1, the right limit is 1, and that means that the two-sided limit is 1 also. So even though we started analyzing a failure mode, it turns out that if one-sided limit exists and they're equal, then actually we, we turned a failure mode into a success because then the two-sided limit does exist. Okay, finally, we also want to talk about infinite limits. Uh, the function f is set to go to infinity from the left at p. In symbols, the left limit of f uh, is infinity. If and only if for x smaller than p but close to p, the values of f grow beyond all bounds. So those are these asymptote type things and I've delayed the presentation of that after the one-sided limits because as we have seen sometimes your left limit is infinity, your right limit is negative infinity and vice versa. So talking about a two-sided limit, yeah it can be done but it is not as versatile as talking about one-sided limits here right away. Okay, left-sided limits that are minus infinity are defined similarly. Sure, it just goes below all bounds, right? It goes down to negative infinity. The defini definitions for infinite right-sided limits are analogous. That's a good exercise. Uh, and uh, then uh, the vertical line x equals p is called a vertical asymptote of the function f if and only if the left limit is infinity or the right limit is infinity or the left limit is minus infinity or the right limit is minus infinity. So a vertical asymptote is something where you've got an infinite limit on at least one side. That's something where you may want to be careful if, if you're not using what I'm writing. Some authors might say that a little bit differently and that's, that's really not a problem. It's There are several reasonable ways to define that and uh, this is one of them. Okay, as examples let's look at the reciprocal function which is also a building block in the computation of infinite limits. It looks like this, and we have that the left limit of 1 over x as x goes to 0 is negative infinity. Sure, the function just goes down to minus infinity. And the right limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x is plus infinity. That's because as we approach from the right, well, the function goes to plus infinity. So we can see here those limits exist, but they don't meet quote-unquote um, because they, they go in opposite direction. Okay, now typical things you can do with these limits is you can take a function and determine its vertical asymptotes and the behavior near the vertical asymptotes. And so basically for finding the vertical asymptotes we need to find where something goes wrong with the limit computation and that is what we get when we take the denominator and set it equal to zero. And if we do that we could try to factor or we can use a quadratic formula and I think this one really at least isn't very pretty in the factoring. I think it can be factored, but let's let's just hit it here. Quadratic formula always works, and so typically I would recommend anytime you need zeros of quadratics, use the quadratic formula. It's just algebra. It may take a minute or so, but if you do it right, you've got the problem solved. You don't have any guesswork involved. Okay, so negative b is negative 1 plus minus square root of b squared, 1 minus 4 times a, which is 3, times c, which is negative 4, divided by 2a, which is 2 times 3. And if you work that out, well, you got a negative 1 here. 4 times 4 is 16, times 3 is 48, plus 1 is 49. So you should end up with negative 1 plus minus square root 49 divided by 6. And that's what it is. Square root of 49 is 7, so you end up with negative 1 plus minus 7 over 6. And those give you two values. You get negative 1 plus 7 is 6 divided by 6 is 1. And negative 1 minus 7 divided by 6 is negative 8 over 6 is negative 4 thirds. So you get 1 and negative 4 thirds. Yeah, that could have still been obtained with factoring, but it, it may have taken a little bit longer. And as I said, look, this way we've got the result, and that's what we're after. Okay, now we need to determine the behavior near the vertical asymptotes. And in order to do that, we have to compute the left and right limits and the way I suggest to do that even though it's a little bit more writing than otherwise but it, it just works out is to do the same thing as for the limit computations when we go towards one from the right I would take the limit as h goes to zero from the right and throughout these computations here h will always be positive and I just go with one plus h in place of x all the way through see that's just the uh, replacement here. We've seen that in the limit computations also, in the regular limit computation. 
Well, then you multiply everything out, right? 2 minus 3 is negative 1, so you get 2h minus 1. 1 plus h squared is 1 plus 2h plus h squared. You multiply that by 3, you end up with 3 plus 6h plus 3h squared. 1 plus h just loses the parentheses and negative 4 is copied down. Then you've got 3 plus 1 is 4, minus 4 is uh, 0. 6h plus h is 7h, so you should end up here with 2h minus 1 over 7h plus 3h squared. Yep, 2h minus 1 over 3h squared plus 7h. Remember to write down the limits, that's something that uh, colleagues, including myself, like to take off for on tests. What you're talking about is the limit, not the function, so even though it's just writing, you have to write down the limit. Okay, and now, well, now we factor, because with factors we can analyze the signs a bit better and also the behavior. Uh, you get 2h minus 1 divided by h times 3h plus 7. And that, of course, goes to infinity because the numerator as h goes to 0 is near negative 1 and the denominator goes to 0, so it goes to infinity. But does it go to plus infinity or to minus infinity? Well, for h near 0 and positive, you end up with negative 1 here. You get a positive number here because h was above 0. It was supposed to be positive. And you get another positive number here. So negative, positive, positive, that's negative. So the limit actually is minus infinity, and there it is. If you go to one from the left, well, you do the same thing, except that this time I want to put the negative signs in explicitly. That's a standard technique in mathematics. We, we like it better to work with positive quantities, and even though we'll also work with negative quantities and simply have to pay attention, uh, here it's, it's kind of nice to have the negative signs in there explicitly. So again, h will be a positive number that goes to zero, and rather than working with 1 plus h, as we did for the approach from the right, we work with 1 minus h, because we're approaching now from the left. Okay, work that out. 2 minus 3 is, is negative 1, so you get negative uh, 1 minus 2h. And the denominator, well, you just have to multiply out the parentheses. Okay, so negative 2h minus 1. 3 times 1 is 1. Then you get negative 2h times 3 is negative 6h h squared times 3 is 3h squared, good. 1 minus h and negative 4 are simply copied. 3 plus 1 minus 4 goes away. Negative 6h minus h gives you negative 7h, so you end up with negative 2h minus 1 in the numerator, divided by 3h squared, copied minus 7h from what we've had. Remember to keep the limit around. Um, <coughs> factor out the h. And now again, h goes to 0 from above. First of all, it's going to blow up because you get something that's non-zero divided by something that goes to 0. And as h is small and positive, the numerator is near negative 1. The denominator has a positive number times a number near negative 7, so that's negative, positive, negative. That ends up being positive, and so the limit is infinity. And, uh, well, let's see. Now we also have to look at negative 4 thirds, and we approach from the right, so we plug things in, and we work things out. Here's where the computation gets nastier, but hey, we, we just have to deal with it. It's just algebra. 2h comes here. Negative 8 thirds minus another 9 thirds is negative 17 thirds. No problem there. Um, negative 4 thirds squared is negative 16 over 9 times 3 is 16 thirds. That's good. Negative 4 thirds times 2h is negative 8 thirds times 3 is negative negative 8 thirds h times 3 is negative 8h. h squared times 3 is 3h squared, no problem. The rest is copied down, minus 4 thirds h and negative 4. And so we get the numerator stays the same. 16 thirds minus 4 thirds is 12 thirds, which is 4, minus 4 is 0. Negative 8h plus h is negative 7h, and the 3h squared stays with us. We factor out the h, and again, we've got something that's negative divided by something that's positive times something that's negative, and so, and of course, because h goes to zero, we end up with an infinite limit. We get negative, positive, positive, ends up being the limit being positive infinity. And finally, the limit as x goes to negative four-thirds from the left. Again, negative four-thirds minus h this time, but keep the h positive, makes things a little bit easier to analyze. We multiply things out, negative two h, 2 times negative 4 thirds is negative 8 thirds, minus 3 is negative 17 thirds, nothing changed there. Negative 4 thirds squared is 16 over 9, times 3 is 16 over 3. Negative 4 thirds times negative h times 2 is, is 8 thirds h, times 3 is 8 h. 
uh, h squared times 3 is 3h three squared, the rest is copied. Uh, so we keep the numerator, keep the limit, 3h squared doesn't change, 8h minus h is plus 7h, 16 thirds minus 4 thirds is 12 thirds minus 4 is 0, so that's all we have here. Factor out the h, we get a negative number divided by something that goes to 0 times uh, something that's positive, so we get negative, positive, positive, and the limit is minus infinity. Okay, what do we have? Let's let's just that's here is the problem with uh, these kinds of online presentations. We don't have enough board space. Let's uh, collect our information one more time from left to right. The left limit at negative four thirds was negative infinity. The right limit was plus infinity. The left limit at one is infinity, and the right limit is minus infinity. And if we want to check that, here's the picture. Left limit at negative four thirds is negative infinity. Right limit is plus infinity. Left limit at 1 is infinity, right limit at 1 is minus infinity, and the vertical asymptotes are exactly here and here. So again, we can also uh, check our work with the pictures as we have done before. And uh, well, that's it already for one-sided limits as well as infinite limits. We have a little bit better a handle on the typical failure modes that we're really seeing in engineering and the sciences for limits. Remember there's always this possibility of these infinite oscillations, but that is something that really most typically you will uh, encounter in more abstract math classes than calculus. If you're interested in those, I'd certainly encourage you to take them. There's a lot of fun stuff in there, um, but for calculus this is enough. I'll see you next time. Thank you.